Hello, in this video I'm going to be reading you an article called Who Thinks For You? This article comes from Awake Magazine from the January 22nd, 1947 issue. You can see the Earl up here. Uh, this is currently on archive.org. And I'll put a link to the Earl down below. So this is in the public domain. And for those of you who don't know, Awake is a publication of the Watchtower Society, that is, of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And for this article, I am just going to read it verbatim without any, without thinking for myself, just, you know, read it straightforward. Invasion forces are striking hard at the peoples of the world. Not that the seething political pot wherein brews World War III has boiled over, it hasn't. But aggression weapons now in action are mightier than military weapons, just as much more so as the pen is mightier than the sword. And if one modernist objects that the sword has been eclipsed by atomic weapons, another may counter that such propaganda organs as press and radio and motion pictures have antiquated the pen. Advances on the propaganda front have not lagged behind the gigantic strides made by scientific mass murder. The target of the propagandist is the mind, and highly developed communications have laid bare the mind of the masses to his pictorial and verbal barrages. By wave after wave and sustained round-the-clock attacks, the professional propagandist seeks to subjugate the minds of the people and to mold public opinion to suit selfish interests. Wherever one turns, he is met by direct frontal assaults or victimized by subtle flank attacks or ambushments. Propaganda is aimed at the public from the newspaper columns, blares at them from the radio loudspeaker, flashes from the motion picture screen, jumps at them from advertising billboards, rolls out in sonorous tones from pulpits, and when the harassed victims turn to the comic strips for escape, they are greeted with another dose. Individuals, groups, and nations practice propaganda in their endeavor to think for the people. Nazi Germany was the classic example. Goebbels, Minister of Propaganda for Nazidom, once inquired, Is not propaganda, as we understand it, a kind of art, that noble art of mass psychology? Nazi Germany spent $100 million annually since 1933 on propaganda. All the other nations expend millions to sell themselves to each other. It is an art, but rather than noble, it is unprincipled and sinister. Devices of propagandists have developed amazingly during the past three decades, and as they increased, a word changed in meaning. Propaganda was once an honest word. Its root idea is the propagating of natural seed. By extension, it meant the propagation of ideas. And as the ideas became more selfish and evil, further extension gave the word a sinister meaning to keep pace with the ideas. Hence today, propaganda has become unsavory in meaning, but its practice has been so artfully developed that millions gobble it up with apparent relish. Defense through knowledge. Your defense against propagandists comes through knowledge of their methods. Reasoning is their deadliest foe. Emotion is seduced as their staunchest friend. Hence it is that their primary purpose is to rout reasoning and stimulate passion. Their play upon your emotions may lead you to the error conclusions. Complacency and self-flattery let you call it thinking, but when you try to give con concrete reasons for your conclusions, you are first surprised and then embarrassed to discover that you have none. An outstanding tactic in stirring emotion is name-calling. By it, the propagandist gives a person or group or idea against which he propagandizes a bad label. The hateful name rouses anger, and the one smeared by it is condemned without any evidence being examined. If one is called a red, a heretic, a yellow traitor, or other name of odious import, the wily propagandist knows that listening bystanders will hesitate to question or examine the charge for fear that they might be considered as sympathetic toward such classes. Most people listen, and if it is discrediting against an unpopular person or group, they believe, 
and it is as, and as it is repeated, it is accepted as incontrovertible truth. Minds become so set that the accused one cannot even gain a hearing. Without ever, gaining, without ever giving ear to the victim, without ever asking for evidence and proof, the charge is accepted and believed and repeated. Before and since the time Nero blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome, unpopular minorities have been made scapegoats. The reverse of name-calling is where propagandists attach glittering, virtuous words to things they want accepted without any examination of evidence. Patriotism, democracy, freedom, and motherhood are words that are loaded down with cherished beliefs. Here again, if you hesitate or question, you are likely to be accused of opposing the virtue rather than it be recognized that you merely seek evidence to justify the use of the revered words to describe the propaganda scheme. Akin to this is the practice of associating with the new idea some organization or person or symbol that already carries public sanction and authority and prestige. Some of the reverence attached to the established and respected persons or things seems to be transferred to the new idea merely by the association that is set up. For instance, to say that the conflict between the Catholic Church and Russia is a fight between God and atheism implies by the relationship of ideas that the Catholic Church and God are synonymous. By such false but subtle transfers of emotion, the clever propagandist sugarcoats a pill otherwise distasteful. Another step taken to sell an idea on merits other than its own is to have testimonials for it from respected or prominent persons. Or vice versa, if the aim is to discredit an idea, the testimonials for it are represented as coming from a hated person or source. Such, such introductions as the president said, our minister said, Hitler once said, or the Pope once said, are designed to lull the hearers into accepting or rejecting an idea without examining it. Advertisers use the ruse often, paying prominent athletes or movie stars to endorse their wares. When you bump into this sort of propaganda, ask yourself whether the testifier is qualified, whether he is disinterested, or what are his motives. Of what worth is the idea on its own merits divorced from the testimonial. A trick worn threadbare by politicians is the donning of the plain folks pose. They boast, of pe they boast of being of the people, of having risen from the masses, of being self-made men who rose from the slums. They love to advertise themselves when they go fishing or swimming or to see the folks back home or when they talk with their neighbors, with farmers, with laborers or when they fly home to see mother on her birthday or at Christmas time and attend the old country church. Such human interest stuff is all right, but when it is studiously splashed about in the newspapers for public consumption, it tends to nauseate. Plain folks are not so publicized. Then there is the propagandist that harps on the theme that practically everybody is doing it. What he is recommending, the few holdouts must follow the crowd, be one of the gang, that since the majority does it, it must be right. If you hold out, you seem to set yourself against the world, a rather conceited position, he suggests. How can you be right and everyone else wrong? Unpopularity may result to the stubborn, resisting minority. You may be impeding progress or stirring disunity or preventing hundred percentism. Appeals are made to large groups to persons as Americans, as Catholics, as Jews, as members of certain classes such as minors, farmers, housewives, and so on. This type of propaganda always tries to make you think there is a grand rush to mount his bandwagon, and that you had better hurry too. It's the winning side. Don't wait and lose out. Don't take time to think, but hurry while there is still time. The propagandist has done the thinking for you and now seeks to stampede you to his side. A potent propaganda dodge is to tell only half-truths. The facts are carefully selected, those not advantageous eliminated and lopsided incomplete views given. Related thereto is the device of giving statistics. An imposing column of figures seems to cast a spell 
over many, and while figures honestly assembled may not lie, clever figurers who manipulate them often do. Silver-tongued orators play on the emotions rather than appeal to reason. Music aids the propagandists to stir hearers to high pitches of religious, militaristic, patriotic, or passionate fervor. Flashy displays, dimly lit cathedrals, publicity stunts, and the like are employed to fire individual acceptance of ideas without examination. Clever cartoons work fast and hit hard, but are not always true. The same may be said for slogans and proverbs. They capture the emotions with their rhythm, alliteration, balance, and their overwhelming power to say so much so quick. Then propaganda stoop to suppression of unfavorable facts. For instance, newspapers suppress the facts about Jehovah's Witnesses. The radio is conducting a campaign to suppress and squeeze out all liberal commentators. And the movies must submit to censorship by a committee of Catholics. The last item answers wonderment as to why so many films exalting Catholic nuns and priests as the heroes and heroines. Moviegoers, don't you realize yet why it is always a Catholic priest involved when religion is to be shown in glorious light, and why it is a Protestant preacher when religion is to be the butt of a joke? It is high time to awake. The fact is that too many people do their thinking by proxy. They allow columnists to do it, commentators to do it, politicians to do it, ministers and priests to do it. And the people are content to buy this second-hand thinking. Propaganda is a challenge to the individual to use his own mind, if he has one, to scrutinize and analyze, to be impartial and unprejudiced, to be wary of words and ideas highly charged with emotion. In short, know the propagandist tricks and defend yourself. Be prudent. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. Proverbs 14.15 So there you go. There's That's the article from Awake Magazine. Um, you have it from the pen of, Je of a, some Jehovah's Witness writer from authorized by the Watchtower Society itself that you should think for yourself you should not give in to propaganda. Obviously, Jehovah's Witnesses are completely and entirely against propaganda. And of course, given that position, we can assume that they have never ever used propaganda themselves because, well, you know, that would be the height of hypocrisy for them to use the very thing that they are denouncing in this article. Thank you for watching.